Good day, everyone. The Society of Actuaries is pleased to present this SOA Candidate Connect webcast, How to Land Your Dream Job. We have over a 1,000 sites registered for today, and we are very pleased to welcome all of you to this program. My name is Jen, and I will be your host for today's webcast. Please note that today's call is being recorded, and all participant lines will be muted during the broadcast. If you need assistance at any time today, send an email to soa at compartners.com or use the live support feature in the chat in the links area on the left-hand side of your screen. Today's presentation will last up to 90 minutes and includes time at the end for question and answers. However, you can enter your questions for us at any time during the presentation. You may submit your questions by typing it into the box in the lower left corner of the window. Then be sure to click on the send, bo send button located next to the box. If you are listening to the audio only and do not have access to chat box, you may submit your questions to soa at compartners.com. These instructions will be repeated later in the program. In addition, I would like to draw everyone's attention to the links box located, located to the left of the slide. To view or print the presentation slides, just click once on the presentation handout link, and a separate web browser window will open to display the information and allow you to print it. We would like to remind you that the SOA adheres to a strict antitrust policy. For more information on the SOA's antitrust policy, please visit the SOA website. And one final disclaimer, presentations are intended for educational purposes only and do not replace independent professional judgment. Statements of fact and opinions expressed are those of the participants individually and unless expressly stated to the contrary are not the opinion or position of the Society of Actuaries, its co-sponsors, or its committees. The Society of Actuaries does not endorse or approve and assumes no responsibility for the content, accuracy, or completeness of the information presented. Attendees should note that the sessions are audio recorded and may be published in various media, including print, audio, and video formats without further notice. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Matt Sauter, who will introduce the speakers. Matt, welcome to the program. The audience is all yours. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SOA's Candidate Connect webcast, How to Land Your Dream Job. The webcast will provide an overview of the recruiting process and how to increase your likelihood of getting hired. The webcast will include insight from a partner in an actual recruiting firm, a practicing FSA actuarial recruiter, and a candidate who just recently landed his first full-time position. Before we begin, I will briefly introduce myself and my experience in the actuarial world. As Jen mentioned, my name is Matt Sauter, and today I'm happy to be, your, be serving as the moderator for today's session. I'm currently a health actuarial analyst at Wakeley Consulting Group in Denver, Colorado. Before moving to Denver, I attended Penn State University, where I graduated with a statistics degree with an actuarial science focus in May of 2014. Over the summers, I interned at Coventry Healthcare and Genworth Financial. Both of these internships were truly great experiences that helped me bolster my resume while gaining relevant industry experience. Additionally, I'm a member of the SOA's Candidate Connect Advisory Board, where I help to produce webcasts, articles, and other resources to help actuarial students such as yourselves to develop in their actuarial careers. Having a strong understanding of the recruiting landscape and process combined with a well-prepared resume were absolutely instrumental in obtaining my internships and full-time job. Because of this, I'm excited to be the moderator for today's webcast. The agenda for today is fairly simple. We'll first start off with a quick overview of the Canada Connect initiatives. I will then hand you over to our panel of experts. Our experts joining us today are Sally Ezra, who is a partner at Ezra Penland Actuarial Recruitment, Amanda Hug, who is an FSA involved with the actual student recruiting at Mass Mutual, and Monajit Samantha, a candidate who just went through the job seeking process and recently joined EY's insurance and actuarial practice to kickstart his career. Each presenter will offer insight into various aspects of the recruiting process, providing you with helpful information to increase your likelihood of landing your dream job. After the presentations, our presenters will participate in a question and answer session. Please note that you can submit questions at any time during the webcast using the chat function in the lower left-hand corner. Canada Connect is an SOA initiative that attempts to engage actual candidates with the SOA community, providing them with information, inspiration, and network of opportunities while in pursuit of the ASA designation. Its main focus is to develop new and relevant candidate content, creating engaging volunteering opportunities, and reaching out to target audiences using in-person events, webcasts, and online media, in addition to the bi-weekly SOA Candidate Connect e-newsletter you have received. On the left side of the window, 
You can see the links to the candidate resources where you will find lots of useful information, including our newsletter, exam support, and SOA Explorer, an interactive map for you to connect with actuaries and employers. In October, we will host a Candidate Connect event in Seattle, Washington. It's a full-day program designed for candidates. It's an opportunity for you to connect with the actual community, which includes SOA members, fellow candidates, local actuarial club, and employer representatives. I'll now hand you over to Sally. Hello, everyone. Sally, it's all yours. Hi. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sally Ezra, and I'm an actual recruiter and co-founder of Ezra Penland Actual Recruitment, as Matt just stated. Um, I've been recruiting actuaries for a very long time, and I'm afraid to admit it, but I've been in this field for probably as long as many of you have been alive. Uh, counseling entry-level actuaries has always been and continues to be one of my favorite things to do. So I was very pleased when I was invited to speak on this webcast. I hope everyone listening gained some job-seeking wisdom from what I have to impart to you. If anything is unclear or if you need any additional information, please do not hesitate to ask questions, either on this public forum or privately if you're feeling a little shy. Uh, for my portion of this webcast, I've been asked to talk about the job market for actuaries. I'm going to share information with you about the job market in total an overview that will discuss trends I think will resonate into the future, but we'll start by discussing some things you should know about the market as you are entering the field. Actuaries are people who are known to be able to look at risks and uncertainties and make sure their companies do not fall into financial harm should an event that causes losses occur. Insurance companies, consulting firms, brokerage firms, governments, and more hire actuaries to manage risks. The skill set you will be hired for includes the points that are made on this slide. First of all, your raw mathematical acumen. Um, also important is the ability to do the math and then understand the business application to the work you produce. Related to that is the ability to make decisions based on the math combined with the needs of the business. Um, an actuary can find an exact number or a range, and then the business needs may require the actuary to figure out what the best number is within a range. And so understanding the business decisions that meet the needs of the business are, are very important. Actuaries, entry-level actuaries in particular, are hired for their strong programming, statistical modeling, and general technical skills. Only a small percentage of actuaries are not what we hear described as hands-on technicians. The technical skills you have will need to be constantly honed throughout your career, and they'll be used throughout your career. Even actuaries who get into high-level management roles are best served if they can do the actua actual technical work of those they manage. It makes them a better manager and more valuable to their company. Lastly, intellectual curiosity goes a long way in this field improving processes, coming up with new ideas, looking at things from, a various, from various viewpoints are all important things that actuaries do. Um, one item I didn't mention on this slide is that I think I should make mention of is your communication skills will be taken into strong consideration when interviewing because employers need actuaries to be able to do more things than just crunch numbers. Um, I've seen the market change. There was a time whenever it was contemplated that actuaries who were called backroom actuaries were in demand. Um, those actuaries did not need to work with others to produce a work product, but that's not the case anymore. You will need to be able to talk to anyone and coordinate with people both within your actuarial team and outside of your actuarial department. Back to curiosity and communication, I can't express enough how important it is to show interest in your career and what happens within the field. Before an interview, Research the company and the people with whom you are interviewing. LinkedIn is a great source of information, of course. And do a general Google search for the person to see if they've written papers or spoken at seminars. Then read about the type of work that they do. For example, if they're a life insurance actuary working on capital adequacy, research what capital adequacy within life insurance is all about. If they work on embedded value, research that term. If they're a health actuary working on provider negotiations, research what provider negotiations are about and so forth. There are insurance 
specific glossaries available, and you should become familiar with those. I can't really stress that enough. Be curious enough to be educated about what you are interviewing for, and that will give you a competitive advantage. Also, I'd like to give you some practical advice here. The best way to search for someone on LinkedIn is through a Google search rather than through the search bar on LinkedIn. Rather than putting the person's name in on LinkedIn, where the results of that search would pull up people with that name from all walks of life, do a more specific Google search. For example, if you are interviewing with Sam Smith, search for Sam Smith Actuary site LinkedIn, and most likely you'll pull the right Sam Smith up right away. If you're looking for Sam Smith and Human Resources, search for Sam Smith HR, then his company name, and site LinkedIn, then you'll find him. And that will save you so much time. As you are probably aware, the current job market for actuaries can basically be broken down amongst the main actuarial disciplines. Those are life, health, property and casualty, and pension. It is wise for you to research the various fields to learn about what each means, what the educational requirements are for each field, and if there are specific exam tracks that support the fields that are of specific interest to you. When an entry-level person asks me what they'll do when they become an actuary, I tell them that initially they will pour over data and spreadsheets, more data and spreadsheets than they would ever imagine, and they will work towards passing exams. The type of work their data and spreadsheeting work will support includes some of the basic actuarial functions, including pricing products, reserving for losses, financial reporting, valuation, and some financial modeling, such as asset liability modeling, capital adequacy modeling, and so forth. These are the bread and butter of the profession, and most actuaries hope to gain experience with various functions and various product lines as well. Some larger employers will have their actuarial analysts get exposure to a wide variety of functions and a wide variety of products through rotations. Other employers will hire Employers will hire an analyst for one department and may in the future transfer them to another area for increased exposure. Others may not do any sort of rotating, which can be cause for someone to want to change employers. And other companies, and particularly small companies, will have their actuaries work on all sorts of products and all functions as needed. And this also gives a wide breadth of experience to the employees. Uh, persons who join consulting firms often find the same thing. They'll get a wide breadth because each project is different. Um, those basic functional needs of employers of actuaries create a nice, solid demand for actuaries, and the skills that you will develop doing these basic functional types of work will create a great base for you as you begin your career. There are um, areas, however, that we've seen demand increase significantly. A function that is causing an increase in demand is enterprise risk management and other related functions that measure and insurers or any risk-taking company's ability to handle the risks that they take. And regulators such as the NAIC, state governments, and rating agencies, too, are requiring insurers to prove their solvency. At a basic level, become familiar with what the NAIC and what rating agencies are requiring from insurers. Becoming familiar with the term solvency too, and also with ORSA, which stands for Own Risk and Solvency Assessment, is, um, are good things to do. Um, know uh, what is financial modeling, risk-based capital, and what is capital adequacy. Familiar, familiarize yourself with those terms. New regulations are increasing demand for actuaries to do work not only to ensure solvency, but also to prove it. Skills employers look for in candidates to do this work are programming skills. At the higher levels, companies will look for experience with specific risk management software, which is developed either by insurance-specific software development firms and teams or perhaps internally at the insurance company, um, so proprietary uh, software. But at the entry level, they're going to look for your raw programming skills that are indicative of your ability to create and use stochastic risk models. Uh, the health market um, it is so strong. Um, Obamacare has driven the increase in the demand for actuaries. Health insurers and consulting firms need actuaries to work on these new government plans and understand the components that have changed the way insurers are doing business. 
there is a huge increase in the demand for actuaries to work on Affordable Care Act, which is known as ACA, Medicaid, and Medicare plans. Pharmaceutical benefit plans have found great benefit to hiring actuaries, too. When you have uncertainty, you call in the actuaries, and that is what all the health insurers are doing in great numbers. Um, the health actuaries regularly are given humongous data sets to work on, and that has also created a huge increase in demand for actuaries to work with and under understand those data sets. Health data analytics, health data modeling, health predictive modeling, whatever you call it, and I don't know if anyone is 100% sure what to call it. Uh, the terms are very interchangeable. But those are terms you will see on job descriptions for health, um, actuarial analyst roles within health companies. Employers will look for experience with SAS, SQL, R, and of course Excel. The entry candidates that have strong computer skills, strong programming, and strong data manipulation skills are more sought after than those without. A great entry-level resume will have, um, and kind of this would be a separate section on your resume. Educational experience with SAS, SQL, R, VBA, and Excel. Those skills listed, along with a couple of exams passed, should get you a great interview activity for health insurers or any employer of actuaries. Uh, one note of caution, however, is do not overstate your skills with these or, or actually with anything ever. Um, impress people with what you know, and remember your entry level. You're not going to know everything so don't try to say that you have knowledge of something if you really don't. Um, the predictive modeling and data analytics roles have created great demand for actuaries, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. More data is readily available than ever. Computers are powerful and inexpensive, and analyzing data 20 different ways is shown to give competitive advantage to companies, to increase profits, and help reduce losses. Health insurers are heavy users of data analytics, as are property and casualty insurers. Daily, we get new requests to fill these types of positions. And they also are asking for actuaries uh, to work in these positions. Uh, life insurers are just figuring out how to make use of data analytics, and early indications are that they, too, will find great value in putting resources to the task. I expect we will see an increase in hiring within life insurers for actuaries to do this work. Um, in fact, because these positions are so rare at this point and it's an emerging field, I have included a slide, which is actually the next and final slide uh, for you to read at your own convenience on your own time. Um, but I've listed a new job description we have with the life insurers that will give you an understanding of what all that entails, meaning what, what all predictive analytics within life insurance entails. Uh, that is a high-level um, overview of the functions that have increased demand, and I'd like to give you a high-level overview of the market demands of the main disciplines of life, health, property and casualty, and pensions. In short, the demand for life actuaries has held, has held pretty steady. We've seen demand decrease for pricing and product development life actuaries, and we've seen demand decrease due to mergers but those decreases have been tempered by the increased demand for actuaries to perform financial and risk modeling. Also, we're seeing signs that the, the demand for pricing and product development actuaries is growing, so that looks promising. The demand for health actuaries is really through the roof. There have been a few large mergers of health insurers just this summer, and that may temporarily reduce demand once the mergers take effect. But even with that, I predict the demand will still outweigh the availability of candidates with health experience. The demand in the property and casualty field continues to be strong, and the insurance market's increased use of data analytics is a strong driver of the increased demand. It is similar to health in that way. The pension field is interesting in that it recently that recent demand has increased, but only because the number of pension consulting employees has decreased due to the retirements combined with consulting firms hiring less pension actuaries over the past 10 years. The actuarial pension market has declined due to fewer companies offering defined benefit retirement benefits to their employees. Pension actuaries traditionally do defined benefit valuations. There has been an increase in demands for, demand for actuaries to work on pension risk transfer which is where pension assets are moved out of a defined benefit plan into retirement insurance products. 
Good recruiters by nature are optimists, and I'm sure some pension actuaries would say that I'm way too optimistic when I say this, but I cautiously predict the pension market will continue to exist and perhaps grow again in the future. Most people would say the defined benefit plan is the best way to insure for retirement. So I think the challenge is how to make those plans affordable and risk-free to the company's balance sheet. And if those things happen, those types of plan, plans may return to fashion. And maybe that's wishful thinking, and it's actually the first time I've said this publicly, but now I've said it. Um, On that note, whatever discipline you go into, I think you will notice that the field will constantly change and evolve to meet the market needs. Actuaries are very good at finding new ways of adding value, and actuaries are very good at seeing opportunities and finding ways to meet new opportunities. Um, Actuaries are also very fortunate to have societies that give great support to the profession and make sure standards are met and that actuaries are always innovating. For example, spend some time looking through the Society of Actuaries website and you'll see all the ways that actuaries are involved in supporting and promoting the profession. Um, Thank you all very much for listening and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all. And I hope you've learned something from my presentation that you'll find valuable to your search for your first job and valuable within your career as you progress. And Amanda, I will give the floor to you now. Great. Thank you, Sally. Uh, Have I said to Amanda? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amanda Hug. I'm an actuary at Mass Mutual Financial Group, and I'm responsible for recruiting for our actuarial student intern programs. And so I'm hopeful that my experiences as a recruiter will help you all make headway in each of your own searches to land that dream job. I'll start with a little bit about myself. I graduated from Wheaton College out in Illinois in 2010, loved my experience being outside of Chicago. Immediately upon graduation, I moved to um, the Springfield, Massachusetts area and joined Mass Mutual's actuarial student program. I had a great experience as a member of that program, had a lot of great rotations doing meaningful work, and of course, as with any program, spent a lot of time in the study room sitting at my desk getting the opportunity to study for my exam. In 2013, I attained my FSA, and you'll find when you get your FSA, a lot of the questions to follow are, what's next? What are you going to do with all your free time? And for me, it was run. I'm not a runner, but I've always had a goal of running a marathon. And so in 2014, after a lot of training, I was able to run the Chicago Marathon. So that was a lot of fun and getting the chance to do something besides being at that desk. Um, so there is, a, <laughs> there is hope um, for those of you that are amidst your studies right now. And now I am in our Worksite Insurance Division at MassMutual. I am a pricing actuary there. And um, in addition to that, I, as I said, do the student intern program recruiting. And I definitely enjoy the chance. I love my day job, but I also really love the chance to meet so many candidates such as yourselves and um, hear why everyone is pursuing this great profession. So as I think about how to land your dream job, I think about a three-step process. And first of all, it starts with developing those qualifications. Because without qualifications, you're not going to be able to build a resume. You're not going to be able to speak to it in an interview. And so you need to start by saying, what are employers looking for? And build from there. Make sure that you have the experiences and the skill sets that will allow you to then go ahead and build a compelling resume that tells a great story about why you're the perfect fit for that job. Um, And then once you have that resume, you need to bring it home in your interview. You've done a lot of work to get to that point and to get that interview. And so you want to make sure that you're prepared and you want to make sure you're able to continue to sell yourself through the entire process. And I think if you do these three things, it takes discipline and it certainly takes perseverance. um, But I'm hopeful that you all will be able to find that job that you're looking for. and I will say that even though this, a lot of this is going to be actuarial specific, especially around the qualifications, this process is the same regardless of what job you're applying for. You've got to make sure you're qualified and that resume um, sets you apart. So something to think about you know, in the future. And at the end of this, I really want to hear from you. So I hope that you guys are writing your questions into the chat box and I look forward to dialoguing at the end during the Q&A. 
All right, so um, step one, develop your qualifications. Let's dive a little deeper here. Um, I recruit for Mass Mutual, and I try to represent what I thought was the qualifications that most actuarial employers are looking for in their entry-level students. Obviously, it's going to vary a bit by company, and you'll have to look at the job description to make sure you, you know what you need, but these are some core skills that I think will help anyone as, in a career as an actuary. So we'll start with an impressive academic record. Whether you're an undergrad student right now, you're a master's student, or um, career changers out there, you certainly, your academic record does matter. Um, we take a look at GPA, what course of study you pursued, and your academic accomplishments. And something I like to mention is that I talk to a lot of candidates about why is GPA so important? Why is that number something that every employer wants to know about. And the reason why is because that number is something you worked very hard for, usually four years, two, if it's a master's, or more if it's a PhD. And so that shows not only that you have the aptitude for the job, but that you have the discipline and you're able to see something through. And so that's why GPA is important to us. Going around the wheel, we also look at exam success. Of course, number of exams is important, Something else to think about is what attempt did you pass your exams on and under what time frame. It's a red flag to us if we see someone who hasn't passed an exam in a long time. We like to see that you're continuing to make progress through those exams. And third, communication skills. Everyone knows in this day and age it's not enough to just be a technical actuary and sit at your desk. You need to communicate your results to both technical and non-technical audiences. So we're going to be looking at your written communication skills. Have you given formal presentations? And then how do you conduct yourself informally? And this might almost be the most important because it often you're going to be communicating just at a conference table in a conference room, and are you going to be able to get your point across and influence others to make a decision? And last but definitely not least is pro proven leadership abilities. So most student programs, Mass Mutual absolutely included, view their student programs as a source for future leaders at the company. Um, employers value the skill set that actuaries bring to the table, and they want those people in leadership roles in the future, which is great for all of you. There's so much opportunity in this field to progress and to make such meaningful contributions to the company. And so past Behavior is the best predictor of future behavior, which is why we consider, have you already taken leadership roles? This could be in extracurriculars. For those career changers, this could be in a job um, that you're currently in. And then informally with your peers, perhaps in um, community involvement. Have you gotten the chance to really show that you're a leader? All right, so once you've developed those qualifications, you need to build your resume. And so what does your resume communicate? A couple things. I think everyone will acknowledge that resumes communicate your experiences, qualifications, and skills. But think about what it implicitly communicates. It communicates that you have attention to detail, you're willing to work hard to put together a good resume, and you have solid writing skills. All of those things are important. As you think about the format, there's no, I can't give you a golden ticket to the perfect format for your resume. Many formats are acceptable. The key here is consistency. You want to make sure that however you're using bold, underline, italics, all of those stay consistent throughout the entire page um, because inconsistencies draw your eye to that and that's going to, that's going to, um, have employers question, do you have that attention to detail that an actuary really needs? Clearly, there should be no mistakes. I recommend one page for entry level and go ahead and PDF it. It sends along much better in an email than a Word document. And consider a well-written cover letter. Um, I would say I only see maybe cover letters on 5% of the resumes that I look at. And that can set you apart if you write a compelling story about why you're pursuing this profession and why you're qualified for the role. And then content. Um, you want to think about your content. Obviously, this is very important. I would recommend starting each bullet point with an action verb, making sure you're using the correct tenses. You want to include any relevant skills, your leadership positions, and you want to tailor it to the specific job description. Now, this 
This takes work. This takes more work than sending out a generic resume to every single company. But it will make a difference. Employers are looking for certain things, and if you can call attention on each specific resume why you meet those qualifications, it's going to stand out. All right, so you've developed your qualifications. You've built this amazing resume. You've landed the interview. How are you going to bring it home? And before we jump in, I do just want to say that the interview matters. It absolutely does. But we are not, I don't want you to put too much value on this because we're not interviewing you to determine who the best interviewer is. We're interviewing you to determine who the best fit for the job is. And so while you should absolutely be prepared, um, it is not the be all end all. And you've done a lot of work to get to this point. So. Um, be confident about that work that you've done and the fact that you are qualified. Be yourself and be prepared. Um, and if you can nail that interview, it will definitely help you land that job. All right, so a couple starting points here. Before you even get to the interview, you want to do your homework. And I know you all are very good at that, so I have no concerns about you doing that. You want to make sure that you've researched both the company and the interview team. Like Sally said, use LinkedIn. Use that Google search. And find out who you're going to be meeting with and what their backgrounds are. That will help you ask more intelligent questions and engage with them on a more personal level. And then you want to know about the company. Nothing is worse than um, having a candidate come in who knows nothing about the firm. People are proud to work where they work, and they want to know that you are interested in being a part of that community. All right, and then this is probably the most time-consuming part of preparing, creating and memorizing your talking points. So of course you're going to think about what questions you may get asked, and you'll want to have ready responses to the expected questions. Why do you want to be an actuary? Why do you want this job? Those are things that pretty much every employer is going to ask. And so have, like I said, I keep coming back to, have a good story. You need to be able to explain you know, why this is the profession for you. And then you'll also want to consider that you will probably be asked behavioral questions. These are questions that ask about your past experiences in order to gauge what your future behavior is going to be. And so you'll want to look at those job descriptions. Perhaps one says you're expected to be an influencer. And you'll want to think about specific examples where you have influenced in the past. And I would recommend coming up with a few examples for each item so that you can share different stories and different experiences with the interviewers. That's going to mean at the end of the day, when the interview team comes together, they have a robust understanding of, wow, this person really is a great fit. Look how many times they've exemplified the qualities that we're looking for. And then creating insightful questions is definitely important. Um, so I've listed out a few different types of questions here. And um, nothing is worse than not coming with questions. So make sure you come with questions. Uh, credibility building questions would be questions that show you bring insight to the table, even though you're asking a question. One example might be if you're perhaps a math teacher right now, a career changer, you might say something like, based on my experience managing a classroom, one of the challenges can be keeping a diverse group of students moving forward toward a common goal. How does such a large organization like yours keep employees focused on their vision? And that shows you're bringing your experiences and it's going to contribute to the company. Why questions? Uh, this could be tied back to the research you did at the company. For example, MassMutual acquired the Hartford's Retirement Plans Group not too long ago. And an insightful question might be, why was that a strategic acquisition for MassMutual? That's a great question. The interviewer will probably have a great answer, and that will start a good dialogue. Personal understanding. This could be asking questions about things you read about them on LinkedIn. Passion questions, that might be, what do you love most about working here? And then future-oriented questions. This would be something like, what do you think will be the most critical initiative for your firm over the next 10 years? Those future-oriented questions show that you are thinking about a future with this company and that you're able to think about vision and think about moving forward. And they will love that. They'll want you to be a part of their firm for that reason. 
And then set up a mock interview. Find a colleague, find a peer, go to the career development center. Practice. Practice does make perfect and it will pay off. And so go ahead and put yourself in that situation even if it isn't necessarily comfortable. All right, so to wrap up, um, we talked about how you land that dream job. To de you develop your qualifications. Figure out what employers are looking for and work towards that. Then you craft a compelling resume and you bring it home in your interview. And I wish you all the best of luck in your job search. I hope that these tips will prove helpful for you as you're looking for that job. And I would encourage you to connect with me on LinkedIn, reach out. Um, we do have open positions at MassMutual for internships and entry-level students. And so if you're interested, go ahead and apply online. Or even you can just go ahead and email me your resume. I would love to meet you all. Thank you so much. And I will go ahead and pass it to Monajit. Thank you, Amanda. And hello, everyone, and good afternoon to everyone who's uh, joined us today. <clears throat> so my name is Monaja Samantha, and I recently joined um, e Ernest & Young, or rather rebranded as EY's um, Insurance and Actuarial Advisory uh, Services um, practice. And I will be concluding the last leg of our presentation today before we uh, open up the floor for questions. So before we dive in, uh, just a brief uh, overview about my background. Um, I joined the University of Waterloo uh, around five years ago. During my time there, I was fortunate enough to have a couple of actuarial co-op terms um, at companies such as Manula Financial, Munich Reinsurance, and Towers Watson. And I graduated earlier this year and um, finally decided to take uh, a di different route and uh, come to the U.S. Um, and uh, join EY's uh, actuarial services practice. And I'm also based out of uh, Hartford, so if anyone is listening from that area, feel free to uh, get in touch after the webcast, and I would love to meet up for a cup of coffee sometime. So <clears throat> the first two aspects of this presentation, um, we've thrown a lot at you in terms of what the market's going, uh, what's happening in the market, and you know a lot of the best practices that, practices that you should employ um, on your job search. And I'm hoping that in my section, I can help you sort of synthesize some um, specific strategies that can help you really uh, enhance your chances of getting hired, no matter which background you come from. So before we uh, get into the nitty-gritty of it, uh, I would like to uh, direct your attention to the last question on that thought bubble is, am I being p active or passive in my job search? And the reason I'm saying that is because this is going to be a relevant theme throughout my presentation, and this is a question that you should always ask yourself as you actually go through this process uh, yourself. So let's get started. <clears throat> the first step, obviously, to this uh, process is, you know, the search itself. And in these days, it has to have a very tiered approach. Obviously, the first step you um, will do is, looking at stuff online, mainly Google, job boards, to really research what locations actuarial jobs exist um, and what kind of jobs are out there, what kind of sectors are you looking at, what kind, of, uh, what kind of candidates do they look at. Another more relevant and growing um, f online feature is LinkedIn. And as Sally and Amanda mentioned, LinkedIn has a lot of uses. But what I found is that as candidates, we can be categorized into two groups, the active and the passive group. A lot of passive candidates, what they do is they set up a very basic profile with some relevant work um, uh, experience and the exams have passed, and they sort of just connect with people from time to time and hoping that you know, some recruiter will one day miraculously uh, reach out to them and uh, write them a message. Whereas the active user base takes a far more uh, curated approach. They enhance their profile as their experiences grow. They add and subtract based on uh, what becomes more relevant to their career path. And they also use it as a way to get in touch with a lot of different folks that they want to connect with. And this, is a, this makes a big difference on your LinkedIn activity because not only does it bring more attention to your profile and become, people become more, um, they, they learn more about you as a person, but it also uh, results in humanizing a lot of these connections that you might, you might pick up on the way. So, for example, if you, 
if you connect with someone on LinkedIn and you see that they're in your area and you reach out for a cup of coffee, then that really goes towards building your professional network and not just another connection on LinkedIn, which makes a big difference in today's world. The next area of focus that you really should look at is attending recruitment events. <clears throat> now, recruitment events can be you know, a company-specific event or an SOA meetup or even a career fair. Um, uh, like in Canada, we have the ASNA conference, and in the New York area, we have the ASNI conference. And I'm sure there's other different conferences around, uh, around the country as well. And again, what I've noticed is Candidates can either be in one or two, uh, where, whether you're an active networker or a passive networker. A passive networker would show up to this event with a few resumes. Um, they will do their necessary due diligence, make the small talk that they need with the companies that they're interested in. They probably won't get through all of it because uh, time runs out, as you know, the, these events are very crowded. And they might not even follow up after that conversation. They might just expect them, uh, employers to reach out to you. And whereas active networkers, what they do is they're likely to research the companies that are coming way ahead of time. Um, they would get in touch with organizers if there isn't enough information on the website of the event, um, and they would try to find out which companies are actively hiring at that point, because not every company will be hiring that, that is attending will be hiring. And then they might take another additional step and try to find out who in their network has, uh, has either worked in that company or has some sort of a connection to that company. And they might reach out to them asking for more feedback, for more uh, information about who might actually be showing up to this event. Because believe it or not, it's the same kind of people within each company that show up to all these events. So the chances are that if you have a friend who is interned there, who currently works there, they've interacted with these people that will be showing up from, let's say, company A. And now, going into the event, the active networker has a big advantage over someone who is far more passive because now they can tailor their pitch to each of these companies because they have a lot more information to go on. They can also manage their time better because if you have, let's say, an hour and you have 10 employers, it's extremely difficult to hit every single one. However, if you know who's hiring and who you're most interested in, you can probably go to them first. Make sure you get uh, the adequate time and the meaningful conversations um, that you want to have with them before moving on to, you know, the rest of the folks. And as a result, you also have a lot more to go on with the follow-up, which is extremely key. Um, if they happen to be in your location in the same city, um, it is highly recommended that you, that you ask for a simple cup of coffee or even meet up for lunch. And in this way, you sort of get the conversation started, and it almost becomes an informal interview process. They really get to know you through these exchanges without, without the intensity of having a formal interview, which is a great way to, uh, to essentially s sell your skill set to them. And finally, the last part, which is probably the most important part, and, I, it, and it's also something that's not readily available to you, like the first two. So your personal network is something that you really have to curate, you have to nurture over time, and it's something that comes from as a result of how you treat the first two resources that are available to you. And the reason why I stress on this is because the more people that you have that have bought into you know, your skill set and where you want to go in your career, the easier it is for you to actually get your resume, get your skill set out there. Um, these people are likely to help you. They're likely to connect you with other people who are hiring at the time that you're looking for a job. And another thing that I learned quickly is that the actuarial community is fairly small and it's fairly tight-knit. And uh, chances are that if you know an actuarial professional in Company A, that they might know similar fo uh, peer folks at a similar level in Company B, C, and D. And even though Company A might not be hiring at that point, company B and C might be looking, and this person, knowing you and knowing your skill set, might um, easily, could easily refer you to uh, their, their colleagues. And this, creates, this gives you a big advantage because <clears throat> it is coming from a trusted source. And because opportunities are always appearing, they don't always, always appear online. However, there are always staffing needs at uh, different companies, and a lot of the time, companies actually prefer to go through these internal channels. I'd like to give you one small example of how I use this was how I connected with Sally Ezra, actually, who was our first speaker. We met on LinkedIn, we connected there, and actually, 
when I was in Chicago for a short visit, I simply sent her a message saying, hey, do you want to meet up for coffee? And Sally, um, I never expected her to respond, but she was delighted that I re- reached out to her, and we actually did meet up for coffee. And now we have a far more stronger professional relationship than simply being LinkedIn connections, and that makes a big difference. So now that we've talked about some of these strategies and how you should go about um, navigating it, let's talk about how effective they are. So this slide is pretty self-explanatory, and I'll speak very briefly to it. When you're applying online, these days, for each application, there's probably, uh, for each position, there's probably hundreds of applications. And it's extremely hard for you to stand out, even if you have an extremely strong resume. Because there are a lot of filters, and a lot of different, pe- a lot of different kinds of people are looking at your resume, and they might simply not see um, your potential, because they're sif- swifting through a lot of resumes. And so it's important to know that applying online isn't, the o- it isn't just effective by itself. When you go to recruitment events, um, it definitely increases your chances because now it's become multidimensional. It's that the focus isn't just about your credentials, it's about personality. And so for those of you who are coming from different backgrounds, let's say you don't have actual experience or you, know, you don't have as many exams or you might have you know, a lower GPA, this is where you can really sell your story. And if you're strategic enough and you've done your research ahead of time, you can really tailor your story to show them, to demonstrate to them why even though you don't fill up all the check marks uh, that the company is looking for in a candidate, you can still provide value um, with, your, with your diversity. And finally, last one, the holy grail of it all is getting a recommendation from someone within the company or someone within the industry. This almost guarantees a shot for you at an interview. Um, unless, you know, they're looking for someone completely different. And it's actually preferred by a lot of employers as well because it reduces hassle on their aspect. They don't have to do a a formal job application process and everything. And a small example, again, I'll share here. Um, There was a situation where I actually applied for a position from a company um, three different times. So they had... They had applied. They posted a, a job uh, posting in January. They probably didn't find someone. Uh, posted again in March, and then posted again in April. And I finally got fed up, and I I looked up online on LinkedIn if I if I had any connection within within that company. And I found out that one of my connections had actually recently moved to that company. I reached out to her and I asked her, you know, what are what kind of person are they looking for? Because I've applied, I haven't really heard back from them. She offered to send over my resume to the hiring manager, and I kid you not, the next day I got a call um, saying that they would like to schedule a phone interview with me, and at the phone interview, he opened by saying my resume was very strong. So it wasn't an issue of my resume not being good enough for them, but sometimes it just gets lost in translation. Maybe I didn't make it through all the filters, maybe there was something wrong, or uh, maybe that there was uh, a lack of staffing on their part in terms of hire and in terms of HR, and it always happens. This is a very re- this is a very real thing. So it's something it's something to keep in mind as you go forward. Is that if you're not hearing back from online applications, maybe it's time to try something else. So now that we've talked about some of the strategies related to um, <clears throat> searching for jobs and how to get your resume out there, let's talk about how you can stand out in this uh, sea of competition. In the interest of time, I've broken it down to really resumes and interviews. So first off, you know, for your resumes, you have to try and tailor it for each company. As Amanda mentioned um, in great detail, um, <clears throat> you have to make sure that you know who you're applying to, what role you're applying to, and highlight aspects of your uh, experience based on those roles. So, for example, if you're applying for a consulting role, maybe it's a good thing that you, apply, um, that you accentuate your communication project, something that you do where you had to uh, use a lot of your mediation skills and communication skills to uh, work towards a solution. Whereas, if you're looking towards if you're looking towards a technical role, maybe you talk about the statistical project that you worked on at school, which might be far more relevant than talking about your, you know, extracurricular um, volunteer skills. Then the second point would be, you know, focusing on your strengths. And I've seen this mistake happen a few times where we get, we try to get, we, we get caught up in trying to fulfill all the check marks. And in an ideal world, we would be strong in all of the four areas that Amanda mentioned earlier. But if you're not, then it's important to know that 
there are better ways to actually sell yourself. For example, highlighting your strengths is far more important than trying to cater to every, uh, every single category. So if you don't have an extensively high GPA, maybe don't put it on your resume unless you're necessarily asked to do so. If you don't have uh, actuarial work, prior actuarial work experience, then you need to absolutely try and sell them on any sort of technical skills you have. Well, one example I can think of was when I was looking for my first actuarial term, um, I was coming off of um, a an, an not related work term where I used Excel. And I essentially, my Excel project was part of my job there. However, I chose to make that my, my most important part, bullet on my resume. And I essentially told them about a macro that I wrote and showed that I can, you know, sh take ownership on a, on a technical level. And that was one of the things that made me stand out. Um, and actually, as I found out later after I got the job, that that was one of the things that, you know, they thought that uh, I could provide value and, like, I could get the technical work done and I was interested in the technical work. And so that's one of the reasons they hired me. So it's important to sort of tailor your experiences. Another great thing to mention is if you, if you, if you don't have, you know, actual work experience, but if you ta you've taken part in a case competition um, in the insurance side or a finance side, that's also a great thing to mention because that actually shows that you've been able to research the industry that you're going to work towards. So now moving on to interviews. These are fairly advanced um, techniques. So I will give a disclaimer that this might not always work. However, this is something that you should start practicing as an interviewee because once, if it does work, when, it, uh, when the opportunity shows up, it will work wonders for you. So the first thing is reading your interviewer. Um, as Amanda mentioned earlier, you have to do your due diligence. You have to do your research before going to an interview about who you're actually going to talk to. But beyond that, on the day of, you sort of have to calibrate your strategies based on the people you meet. And some of the ways to do it would be to try and see what kind of a person they are. The way I approached it was I would try to bucket people. For example, if, does, a person, does the person I'm interviewing with you know, enjoy high-level storytelling or do they enjoy, enjoy a much more detailed-oriented approach? And if I can find it, and the way you sort of figure these out is based on the questions they ask. If I'm describing my work experience, will they, do they ask me how exactly I use the specific software, what exactly I did in this specific scenario? Or do they ask about, you know, what the results were after I did the work? And based on those questions, as you go on in the interview, it's good to tailor your, your answers to, the, to what they're looking for. Because that really shows that you can, you know, be flexible, and it shows that you're a better fit for their company, or at least to work with that person. And it makes a far better impression because sometimes if a high-level person um, is interviewing you and you get too carried away in the details, you could end up boring them. So it's something to keep in mind and it's something to practice on a regular basis, um, even just through conversations. The second one is actually a bit more difficult one where you're trying to control the narrative. Now, what I usually always did before going into an interview was I recognized sailing key points of my resume that I definitely wanted to highlight that I felt was most relevant to the role. And throughout the interview, what I would try and do is I would try to guide the conversation towards those points so that before I leave, I've touched on those points um, and made sure that uh, I stand out in their eyes. One, one of the biggest examples of this was during my EY interview, um, I was coming off of a case competition just, uh, just a few days before the interview, and I had, uh, I had to manage to win the case competition. And it was something that I definitely wanted to emphasize. And so right off the bat, as we made small talk about how our day was and stuff like that, I, I, I simply said, just uh, as an informal thing, is like, oh, no, the last few days have been pretty busy. Um, I was working on his case competition, which was very challenging, and I, and, but we ended up winning, so it was worthwhile. And right off the bat, she got very interested, and she, a she actually asked me to walk her through the entire case competition process and also, you know, what our recommendations were. And all of a sudden, one-third of the interview was me talking about this case competition, which was very relevant in my mind, and I spoke about it very passionately. And we didn't even get to the actual core actuarial stuff until much later, and that sort of set the tone for the interview. So it's something that you should definitely work towards where you, should, where you try and subtly um, guide them towards 
what your strengths are so that you can make a difference um, and you can stand out from the competition because something like Excel might not actually make you stand out as much as something as much as a unique experience like, you know, participating in a case competition or uh, part- uh, organizing a conference, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, you know, how do you get better at this? Mock interviews are really key. And I would say, you know, not just mock interviews, but also trying this on regular conversations with your friends, with colleagues. Um, try to practice, practice, practice these skills as much as you can because the better you get, the, the more experience you get at this, the more natural it will become, and you don't even have to think about it when you're interviewing, and you just sort of happen to uh, employ this strategy. So finally, I would like to end off by just briefly talking about how you should you know, go about picking the right job. And for me, it's always been about three main things, you know, sector, culture, and lifestyle. Um, Sally uh, spoke in detail about the different sectors, what's going on. So, you know, you should familiarize, familiarize yourself with um, everything that's going on in the news and see what interests you. If, if, if you find one sector's uh, future outlook much more interesting, then maybe that's, one, that's the one that's right for you. So gravitate towards that. Um, in terms of culture, you know, there, there are large companies with rotational programs versus smaller companies, and they both have their pros and cons. In a large company, you might have more candidates that you're competing with, so it might be harder to stand out. However, in a smaller company, you might uh, actually be one of the few junior uh, hires, and you might get a lot more exposure, a lot more work from different kinds of, uh, from different kinds of areas. So it, that really depends on, a very, on your personal choice about what, where you want your career to be and where you want to go. And finally, lifestyle. Um, the biggest example I can think of, you know, is consulting versus industry. Consulting is a lot more variable. A lot more, you have to be a lot more flexible, but it, and it involves traveling. Whereas industry is a lot more streamlined. Um, it's it's more of a nine to nine to six job, and you might not get the flexibility, but uh, you might get a lot more support for studying, etc. And it will be less traveling, and so you will be in one place. So depending on Depending on your preferences, you sort of have to look at where you want to be in your life as well, because it's not just about, you know, where you want to be in your career. And eventually, you know, I'm sure all of you will end up finding, hopefully, will end up finding the right fit. With that, I would like to conclude my uh, leg of the presentation. And, you know, I would recommend that you get in touch with me either through LinkedIn or send me an email. I would love to, get, I would love to chat and help you through your process, because I know how stressful it has it is to go through this process and and now I would like to open up the floor for questions and actually I'll pass it on to Jen. Thank you very much Manajit for a great presentation to the rest of our presenters as well. We've received a ton of great questions in the chat box but in case you missed the introduction uh, there is the opportunity to type in your messages for our presenters now please do so in the chat box in the lower left corner of the window and then click on the send button. And we'll do our best to get to as many as possible with the remaining time that we have. So I will turn it back to our moderator, Matt, to start with the question period. Thanks, Jen. Getting a lot of good questions in from our attendees. So I guess we'll just start with some general questions. Uh, The first one's for you, Sally. A lot of candidates today are interested in the current dynamic for the entry-level market, and I know you touched on this a little bit at the beginning of your presentation, but um, particularly given the recent attention and praise the actuarial science career has received, the number of actuarial candidates has grown substantially over the past few years. How do you see this affecting the entry-level market? Is the supply getting greater than the demand? Are you seeing a huge change in number of exams being required? Are there salary and benefit changes? What exactly are you seeing? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question, and I touched on it a little bit. And one piece that I, I left out um, due to an interest in time was the topic of persistence. And Manajit um, commented on this a little bit. But the, for, for every entry-level position that's available, a company will get hundreds of resumes, and those will be resumes of qualified candidates and also resumes of unqualified candidates, perhaps the person's dad said, you know, try to be an actuary, send your resume out. Um, But a qualified candidate will have two exams. Uh, Internship experience is great, but if you don't have it, like Manajit said, figure out a way to highlight your skills. Um, And 
And it's just a matter of being persistent. You can't give up. Plenty of people will give up, and, and they won't be actuaries. If, if you really dream of being an actuary, do what Monajit said and, and, and get creative in your search and, and make it happen and, and don't give up. Don't give up. Um, the salaries have stayed pretty, um, I guess, flat for entry level. Um, they haven't gone down uh, due to the, the increase and the supply of, of candidates available, um, the actual skill sets valued, and they, the companies aren't taking advantage of, of the increase in the supply of, of actuaries um, from, from a salary perspective. Um, did I answer everything? Yeah, I think that was great. Um, so going off that, how does what you just said kind of vary by geographic region, if at all? Are there large difference, differences in type of employers as far as life, health, p and retirement by, by geographic region, or is it pretty much the same? Yeah, um, I did a little research as to, to where the jobs are. Um, about 40% of the jobs are in the Northeast, 30% are in the Midwest, 20% uh, are in the Southeast, and 10% are in, in the West. Um, about 30 to 35 percent of all the new jobs uh, for entry-level actuaries are in the health area, about the same for property casualty, 20 percent are for life and annuities, and 10 percent of the jobs are in the pension uh, market. So um, with regard to the break of the geography, I would assume for the most part um, that those percentages work in, into the, the geographic out, um, breakout. Um, I, also have estimated and that there are about 3,000 um, candidates entering the field each year as an entry-level actuary, at least in the last few years. So it's, it's pretty small, but um, again, it's, it's um, your skills, the, the listeners' skills here are in very high demand, so just, just don't give up and, and keep working. And if you can remain geographically open, uh, just go for the opportunity over location. That will help you a lot, too. Great. Thanks, Sally. Uh, and Monaji, we, we were talking about life, health, and, and you talked about that a little in your presentation. Um, so what were kind of your decision process as you're going through that, and, and maybe more specifically, how did you choose the exact company that was right for you? All right. Thanks, uh, thanks for the question, Matt. Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to, like, the sector, I sort of fell into the life side. Um, I got introduced to the actuarial world on the life side, and I never really got around to explore um, the PNC side. Uh, I did, however, explore life and health um, from different perspectives, in, as in the t traditional industry line, reinsurance, and also from the consulting perspective. And for me, the work I did felt like a good fit, and I also like... Um, some of the changes that are going on within the industry. There's a lot more regulations going on, which in introduces a lot more work for actuaries. And it's something that, you know, it's something that actually brought me to EY currently is because EY is a big uh, player in that respect in, in that they help insur insurance companies um, uh, deal with all these new regulations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of why I specifically picked um, different companies, I would say culture is a big importance for me. Um, in terms of EY, like it was a very nas national practice, it was very collaborative and high intensity, and this really goes to like how much you know yourself. For me, I perform much better in a high intense, uh, high intensity uh, environment. So for me, that seemed a lot better. I also like the lifestyle. I want to I want to travel around a bit, um, and the consulting aspect of it, meeting clients, uh, improving my communication skills. Um, in that respect, was also. Uh, a big factor for me in terms of why I picked the job. So I would say get to know the company um, that, you're, that you're interviewing with. As Amanda mentioned earlier, insightful questions go a great way in, in helping you do that. So you know, don't just waste those opportunities when you're at an interview. Um, ask the questions that you're genuinely interested in. Um, if, if, you're worried, if you're worried about you know, what the culture might be, if it's too hierarchical, if it's flat, um, ask those questions because the, the company would appreciate, you know, you getting to know them uh, and as well as, you know, you have more information to go on as you make the decision of which exactly, which job you want to start. But yeah, that, that, that would be my advice. 
Great. Thanks, Wananjeet. Um, Amanda, the, the career fairs are approaching and the, the hiring season is pretty much here. Um, candidates want to know how they can kind of impress employers in a short period of time and what they can do to stand out. What are some things you'd recommend students do at career fairs? And perhaps just as important, what are some things you've maybe seen or experienced that, that students definitely should not do at career fairs? Great. Thanks for the question. Um, we are definitely gearing up, so I'm excited to go to many career fairs this fall. Um, surprisingly, I think as I was contemplating this, the number one thing you can do to stand out is have a strong resume. The way you conduct yourself is of the utmost importance, but if you don't have that strong resume, we are going to very much enjoy meeting you but still have to pass because you don't meet our qualifications. Um, so, But once you have that strong resume, portraying confidence communicating clearly if you're asked about um, something you did on your resume. Being able to describe it at a high level, not getting bogged down in the details is always good. And then researching the company ahead of time. So most people approach our booth and know nothing about the firm um, because there's so many there, and I understand that. But if you can do your research ahead of time and find out which companies are going to be there, know which booths you're going to walk up to, Know the locations that they have. Know the job openings that they have. That will make you stand out. Um, two things I would recommend not doing. One would be going into a bit of a sob story. Occasionally I have candidates who have really struggled to find a job and they come up and it comes across as a sob story and a lot of excuses about why they haven't been able to find a job and I sympathize. This is not this is a very saturated market. It's tough, um, but that's not the time and the place to be going into that. So you want to portray yourself with confidence and in, um, optimism rather than sort of that negativity. And then definitely want to make sure that you approach it as a conversation and not as a presentation. So I've had candidates walk up to me that it sounds like they have a script and they've rehearsed it and they simply sort of spit it back at me and we're not talking. And so I want to make sure that you know you have your talking points and you can work those in, but you can do it in an appropriate way that we're still two professionals having a conversation. Those are some tips I would offer based on the number of candidates that I've met. That's great. One of the first things you mentioned was just having that really strong resume, which is obviously really important. Um, a lot of students are asking questions about, you know, how many exams do I need, or, you know, wh what about my major GPA versus real GPA? Uh, what are some like recommendations that you have on number of exams that you're looking for, uh, GPAs, and also could you follow up on earlier when you mentioned uh, having leadership uh, opportunities on your resume, what, what kind of those are in a, academic accomplishments, kind of expand on what you're looking for in that regard? Absolutely. Um, so regarding GPA, most companies are going to be looking for your cumulative GPA. Major is good too, but um, cumulative. And the GPA from your most recent um, time of study is going to be the most important, but just because you have a master's doesn't mean we don't like to see your undergrad GPA. So it all matters. Number of exams, um, this is specific to Mass Mutual, and other companies may have different philosophies, but we really consider the school that you're attending, and we have expectations for exams based on that. So if you are coming from a liberal arts school where you're simply a math major, there's no exam support, for an internship, we consider one exam to be acceptable. Sometimes we've even hired people without any if they're in that situation. And then full time, we would say maybe two. Now, contrast that with a school like a SOA Center of Actuarial Excellence. There's going to be a much higher bar because there's so much support from um, classes and professors and study materials in order to pass. So we would look for probably two for an internship and four for full time. And then um, the leadership and the academic accomplishments. Leadership um, can come in many ways, but I just like to see people who, one example for career changers is if you are in your current role and you've been asked to step up and lead a team or you've had the opportunity to drive forward a project. And communicating how you got that opportunity, for example, Perhaps you got it a few years earlier than people might have expected. Share that. Let people know, you know, my manager thought I was doing such a good job. He, was, he thought I was ready to take on the challenge of managing people. Let us know that um, you were recognized in that way. 
And then academic accomplishments, this would be something like um, receiving an award. Many schools now put forth academic awards or sometimes awards that you both have to have a strong academic record but also community involvement and giving back and um, volunteer work. And so I like to see if someone has one of those awards or if someone has a full tuition scholarship, that certainly makes a difference. Great. And what about the major. Do, do students have to have an actual science, statistics, or math degree major to be considered for positions? Um, again, this is going to vary by company. For some, yes. For some, a technical major that demonstrates your aptitude for the profession is going to be important. And if you don't have that, you might want to consider going back and getting a master's if the companies you're targeting view that as very important. However, there are other firms that are more open-minded. Um, MathMutual prefers a technical degree, but we have hired many career changers over the years. I can think of um, a biology major in our program. We have some PhDs, former computer programmers, former teachers. So there certainly is flexibility out there. Now, if you don't have a technical degree, it's going to be incredibly important to show that you have already passed exams successfully and easily. Um, that will almost be the replacement for that math, finance, econ degree. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Sally, do you have anything to add to what Amanda said about exams and GPAs? Um, I don't have too much to add about that, although, I, well, more about the, the, uh, the major. Um, I have something to add in, along those um, lines. If, if you don't have one of the obvious degrees, um, what you can also do is, going back to the Google searching, is find actuaries that have a similar gr degree to you. Um, if you are an aeronautical engineer, there are actuaries who have that background. And reach out to them and make a connection with them. Um, find out what insurance companies um, do uh, work um, in in that field. Um, what who's insuring um, space, for example? The uh, um, that's a that's a growing field. Um, so find out what companies are doing that, and see if if you can segue into becoming an actuary at one of those companies. So you just have to get creative if you're not if you if you haven't majored in one of the the obvious um, majors for actuaries. Great, thank you. And I think I heard Amanda say that she's looking for maybe around two exams for an internship and four for full time. I imagine some of our, our participants may have been uh, shocked by how high that is. Is that accurate? Can you get jobs at lower with a lower number of exams? What are you seeing out there? Yeah, and I'm sorry, I should have commented on that. Um, perhaps, um, and I know Amanda kind of made mention of this, but Mass Mutual and some of the larger employers definitely have. Um, higher standards or higher higher bar uh, of entry. Um, a lot of the companies um, are fine with with two exams. Um, two exams and sitting or preparing for your next exam, uh, whatever it is, um, listed on your resume should actually be enough for um, an entry level position. And, and particularly if you have some internship experience or are able to find um, ways to to highlight some of your skills. That, that will be uh, relevant and of value to the, to the potential employer. This is Amanda. I just want to jump in and clarify. Just um, When I cited the number of exams, I gave an expectation for schools that have actuarial science majors. People are per, uh, pursuing that profession very clearly and taking classes related to it. That was the two and the four. Um, but then also for schools that, that that may not be your major or you may be a career changer, I said that less than that would be absolutely acceptable. Perfect. Thanks, Amanda. Um, Sally, back to you. We're, I mean, we're getting a lot of questions about uh, certain situations that students are in. Um, one particular we're getting a lot is students who've passed maybe three, four actual exams and are graduating in December or May, but haven't been able to secure that internship internship position yet. What do you recommend for them in their in their last couple months here in undergraduate to do, and how to finally land that first job? Um, Monajet uh, touched on this a little bit, but figure out what skills you have that can somehow act as a replacement for an internship. 
um, activity. So, um, you know, if you've worked on some projects at school where you've had to work with um, SQL um, and work with large data sets, and if, if it's an insurance, a, a project dealing with insurance, great. If not, uh, just be able to highlight that and find whatever you can find in your background that has some commonality to the many job descriptions that you've surely read as an entry-level actuary. Um, just try to highlight those in your on your resume and then possibly on a cover letter as well. Um, and I really do feel as if persistence is key. Um, if you have are graduating and you have a couple of exams and you just don't have the internship experience, reach out to every potential employer within a one-hour radius of you. And then after you've done that, reach out to every potential employer in a four-hour radius to you. And local is, is an easier hire than far away. So just start targeting your, your search to the areas that um, that are around you and you know, find other actuaries that have graduated from your school and reach out to them on LinkedIn. Um, a lot of people have to spend a lot of time on their job search. The entry-level job search for most people will be the hardest job search you'll ever have in your career. And you just have to stay persistent and smart and creative about the way you go about it. Yeah, and um, I just want to sort of add on to what Sally said. If you're in this unique situation where, you know, you are lacking in certain areas, then my advice to you would be actually get FaceTime with the prospective employers because it's much easier to sell your story when you're in front of them than on a piece of paper. And that is something that I always tell anyone who is any sort of disadvantage. Like if you're, if you're some, someone who's changing a career, if you're someone who lacks an internship, when you go up there in front of them and sell them on a school project and what you did, it's a lot more impactful and it makes them um, remember you for a longer time than just reading it on a resume. But yeah, that would be my short addition. Great point, Monajit. And, and you talked about you know getting coffee with people earlier. What are like some really solid ways to to get people to accept that coffee invitation or that lunch invitation? Well, given how busy these employers are and how many you know emails and applications they get. Um, and then whenever you do end up having that meeting with that person, uh, what are some general things you try to talk about? Do you keep it light, or do you try to essentially pitch yourself in 30 minutes? So that, that's actually a very good question. And as you mentioned, everyone is really busy these days. So I don't think when you, when you message someone, I don't think you should have an inherent expectation that they will get back to you. For example, when I messaged Sally, I didn't just expect her to you know, hear, uh, hear back from her. But... Given the industry we're in, it is actually surprising how many actuarial folks and, you know, related in the industry are so nice that they'll actually take their time to actually reach out to, even if it's, you know, a few weeks later. And I've been absolutely blown away by that, and it's something that, um, that was really encouraging. So I strongly recommend, you know, starting to getting into the practice. In terms of how you should word the initial communication, don't come off as, you know, like, you know, I want to meet you or something like, if you have time, I would like to connect and maybe discuss, you know, my uh, career prospects or, you know, maybe discuss your company. Um, <clears throat> they know that you're trying to, you know, gain more information, trying to gain more insights into the industry. And so um, they're more likely to help you because, you know, they want to do that. And so it's also important to recognize that certain people are more likely to do that uh, than others. So people within the recruitment firm, like, for example, someone like Amanda would more likely be able to uh, respond to, to your coffee invite um, than maybe someone who's not as involved with recruiting because she enjoys it. She enjoys getting to learn about um, different candidates. And in terms of what you should do at the coffee meet, what I try to do is I try to set up a set of questions. They can range from, like, super technical to, like, you know, what do you do at your job? Um, do you use this? Do you use this? Or, you know, just in general, um, some conversation starters would be, you know, how did you end up where you are? Like, if there's a manager, you know, how, what was your sort of your journey? Um, or how did you get interested in actuarial? And <clears throat> I would avoid questions where, like, you know, are you guys hiring? And some logistical stuff where it's specific to job-related because, it is on the informal side. You're trying to get to know this person instead of trying to get employed with this person. And so that is the distinction I would make when you're having this conversation. And as you learn more about them, what you should essentially try to do is informally bring up 
things relevant to them that they will find interesting about you. For example, you know, if, if they talk about, you know, their work and it being technical and them working on a technical project, maybe you can say, oh, you know, that reminds me of the time where I worked on this project at school and we, we had a group of people. Or if they're talking about, you know, like how team dynamics play a big part in like an insurance company, you can talk about how you had a group project at school that uh, taught you about that or a, organize a, or a volunteer activity where you led an initiative. And so it's things like that that really make a big difference and make you much more memorable to the person. Perfect. Thanks, Ranjit. And uh, Ranjit, you went to Waterloo in Canada. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So what, what was your transition like from being in a Canadian school where I, I believe they don't have the standard GPA 4.0 system that the U.S. has? And what was your experience transitioning into applying to American jobs here in the U.S. and that whole process? Um, so for me, it was, I, I, I will say this, like, you know, you are at somewhat of a disadvantage when you're not within the U.S. However, I'm not saying, like, you know, it's not possible because I do know a lot of Canadians and international students who end up working here. So what you need to do at that point is you need to make sure that you are worth the sponsorship that the company will give you. And that happens when, you know, you really have to craft a a well-written resume and cover letter, and you need to give a lot of importance to that. It's not, you have to pay pay a lot more attention to detail about it. And if if you have a connection within the company, it's good to get in touch with them to sort of discuss your prospects, um, see if the company is even hiring at that point, because applying online might not be as effective because I know that on the application thing, they ask if you will need sponsorship and it might be, you know, your resume might be on the back burner right off the bat because of that. So in my case, I had a personal connection with EY and that's really how the conversation got started. And they usually go through a phone interview and then they bring you to an on-site interview. And You have to always remember that you have to be a notch above everyone else in the pool, uh, in the candidate pool they're looking at, because they have to invest extra money to bring you over. And so that's a reality that you have to accept off the bat if you're trying to transition from an international location to the U.S. So (coughs) it's important to tailor your pitch even more. For example, my biggest asset coming into my job at EY was my GGY access, access experience. It's something that the U.S. insurance uh, industry is slowly adopting, and it's it's a, it's a it's a situation where you know there isn't as much of GGY talent within the U.S. And so, me having experience throughout through my internships on GGY, that was a big sell for me. And I made sure to you know hammer that in during the interview itself that you know I am interested in GGY work. I, I enjoy that work, and I have a lot of experience at it. So you know you can just sort of throw me into it um, right off the bat. So you have to think about things like that when you're trying to transition into a U.S. role from international uh, location. Great. Thanks again, Monajit. Um, Sally, one question before I, I move on to career changers. Um, a lot of students maybe have a, a couple exams, maybe an internship, but aren't able to find that full-time job. Do you recommend graduate school as a next course of action for them? That, that's a tough one. I feel bad recommending something that takes so much time and costs so much money. Um, I would probably recommend figuring out what skills I what skills I would need to to become an actuary. What would I What do I need to do to get somebody's attention? So if I've got so, strong SQL skills, I'm really great with data. Perhaps I would join an organization within their uh, data analytics area, uh, particularly if there's some interaction with the actuarial department, if it's an insurance company. Um, But I would try to find some related field where what I'm learning within that role will help me um, improve my my resume for the actuarial career. Um, That can be dangerous, um, but that's that's one thing to consider. The other is to consider graduate school. And then the other thing is just to um, hold tight and, and get a job at a coffee shop and just keep spending the majority, take looking for your next job, looking for your job as a full-time, your full-time employment. 
Great, thanks, Sally. I'm going to try to ch switch the conversation a little bit to career changers. Um, I know a lot of the attendees today are career changers who don't necessarily have direct access to the university-run career fairs. Um, Sally, what mediums do you think you'd recommend to these candidates to find interested employees? Um, yeah, I would definitely go to any career fairs and do all the things that Amanda and Monajit talked about. Um, there are regional actuarial club meetings um, held at various times throughout the United States. Um, so find um, find out um, which actuarial club would service your area and start making connections within um, within that group. Um, there are some um, specific um, actuarial organizations such as uh, the Chinese Actuarial Club or the International Association of Black Actuaries. Consider joining that. And then again, there's, um, Monajit said, uh, create a, a personal connection um, with some people in your geographic area and hopefully somebody will hire you. Um, I see a lot of career changers um, be successful in becoming actuaries, and again, it's the ones that are truly committed to the process and really take it as their number one goal and and act like that and do the things that they need to do to get a job, do all the networking, figure out why they're going to be good at it, and be able to explain that to people whenever whenever they meet with them. Great. And since most of these career changers are not following the typical actuarial career path, um, they don't necessarily have some of the, the skills and, and resume that we've kind of been talking about previously this whole session. What are the main skills that these career changers need to have to help them stand out in this market? And specifically, we're getting a lot of questions about exams. Are, is three exams too many to have as a career changer without any relevant actuarial experience? Should they keep going or develop other skills? Um, I, I think three is a great number because it really does prove that you are dedicated to becoming an actuary. Um, one of my favorite things on a resume is whenever somebody lists their exams and then they put the next exam they're preparing for. So on your resume, if you're a career changer, having three exams preparing for and whichever next exam you're, you're preparing for, and you would list each exam out um, separately. Um, and then again, highlighting anything you've done in your past work experience that's going to be relevant within the actuarial profession is, is important. Great, thank you. Um, Amanda, do you have any experience looking at career changers coming into Mass Mutual? And if so, uh, what, what kind of things do you look for, and, and how do they kind of break into that market? Absolutely. Um, so like I said, we definitely have had a number of career changers that we've hired here. We love them because we're looking for diversity in our program across many planes. So um, that includes backgrounds that people are coming from. Um, I guess I would say for career changers, exams are important. Like Sally said, you want to demonstrate that commitment um, to the profession. And so that's first and foremost. And if you can pass those exams quickly, I've seen people pass PFM and MFE in the course of six months. Um, that's going to stand out too because it shows, you know what, I'm doing this and I'm going to make it happen for myself. Besides that, I would say what's important is the fact that you have drive, ambition, and energy. Those things um, can translate across many careers and will help you become a successful actuary. So I would love to see that you have in your previous career, you, d you gave it your all, and you devoted yourself to it, and you were passionate about it, and um, you rose to um, a new level because of that. So in my previous example, I talked about potentially managing a team, or perhaps um, we've had teachers come in who wrote textbooks. Um, something you're doing that makes you stand out in your current profession indicates to me that you're going to stand out in your new profession as well. Perfect. Thank you, Amanda. I believe that's pretty much all the time we have today. I do want to point out one thing. A couple questions were coming in asking about uh, contact information for the presenters. And if you look at your links, I believe there is an area where you can download the slide deck. And in that slide deck, there should be contact information for all their presenters. Um, if not, just reach out to any of us uh, using any of the, the information that's available, and uh, we can make sure to pass on that information to you. Uh, at this point, I'd like to hand it back over to Jen. 
Great. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you for a great presentation today. With that, we are going to conclude today's webcast. Uh, before you go, we would like to get your feedback on the session. If you could please take a moment to complete our webcast feedback survey. It's link number two in the links box on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, click on Submit when you've completed that evaluation to send us your responses. Your comments and suggestions are very important to us, and they help us to provide you with this kind of quality programming. To register for any of our upcoming webcasts or meetings or to purchase recordings of previous webcasts, you can visit www.soa.org today. Thank you for your participation in today's webcast. We hope to see you here again soon. Today's program is copyright 2015 by the Society of Actuaries with All Rights Reserved. This concludes today's program. Thank you. You may now disconnect.